Welcome to Rye Hill Baptist Church for Wednesday evening, November 9th, 2022. This evening's message is brought to us by Pastor Michael Franklin and is titled, Attitude is Everything, from the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 25 through 31. Enjoy. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And you will be very familiar with this story, but we're going to take a different twist. Every, every, just about every sermon I've heard in this text uh, deals with the prodigal son and all that is going on there and the father and uh, all that's going on there. But uh, you know that, so we will not go back over the prodigal son. Uh, you, know, you know, it's just one of those deals where the father is a picture of Jesus Christ and God the Father uh, welcoming welcoming us home. And it doesn't matter how far you stray, doesn't matter what you do, God forgives, uh, God welcomes you back, and uh, God loves you. But today I want to talk to you about attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. Uh, Let me give you the outline, number one, an attitude of anger. An attitude of anger. Number two, an attitude of self-righteousness, an attitude of self-righteousness, and number three, an attitude of self-centeredness, an attitude of self-centeredness. And in our text, uh, Jesus told this story, and really what I believe this story is about, it it is about forgiveness, it is about love, uh, but he, he, he really, in the text, part that we are looking at. He is, what I believe, is is talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. You know, they were just always on him, and they just would not leave him alone. And uh, he tells this story, and uh, he he really gives a great illustration, which, which I'll be sharing with you uh, in just a few minutes, about uh, the elder son. So let's look at an attitude of anger, Luke 15, verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. And again, you know, the older son uh, had stayed there. Uh, The older son had done what was right. Uh, The older son would be probably uh, a model child. Uh, The older son had no idea I believe at this time that his brother had come home, and also he really in his own mind was thinking, what is that? Why is there music coming from my house? Verse 26, so he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. And so Right there, you can see the, the, the young prodigal had come home, uh, and his father had been brokenhearted uh, over him leaving. And I believe with all my heart, you know, every day uh, his father would think, is today the day? Would my, would my youngest son, would he be coming home uh, today? And, uh, you know, when you see the fatted calf, it has to do with what we would call fellowship. Okay, they were, ha- they were having a celebration uh, because the younger son had come home. Then verse 28, it says, but he was angry and would not go in. He was angry. My first question when I read this is, what was he angry at? Okay, I believe first he was angry at his father. Why? Because, uh, you know, he, from what you can tell, in the dialogue later on, you know, his father had never done this for him, okay? He had never killed the fat calf. He never had invited his friends over. And so I believe he was angry at his father for forgiving his younger brother that kind of, you know, smeared the family image, uh, wasted away money, and yet his father was willing to forgive him. So I believe his anger was at his father. But not only that, I believe his anger was at his younger brother. 
You know, who does he think he is? He's been gone. He has wasted things. He has embarrassed our town. He has embarrassed our family. And, and dad just lets him walk back in here like nothing had happened. And it said, therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. Folks, I see this everywhere. There are angry people everywhere. The last time I rode my motorcycle, it's been five or six, probably six weeks ago, I went and I was by myself and I went in a fast food restaurant in Poto and I ordered my food and I sat down and, you know, I, I just want to eat. I just, you know, I, I just want to eat and get on, get back on my bike. And so a man came in there and ordered something. And when he, he had a special order and when he got it, he, they did not do what they asked him to do. And so this man, I'm, I'm not kidding you, he made a scene right there. He came up and took that burger and threw it on the counter. And he said, you messed my order up. I told you exactly what I wanted. And not only that, he had to wait on it. And he said, you're wasting my time. And he said, I want my money back. And, and I'm getting out of here, and I'm going to tell everybody that I know to, to, to just not come to this restaurant. And so the manager there was trying. He apologized. He was being nice. He was, you know, doing everything, uh, you know, that he could do to smooth this over. And he said, uh, if you will just wait. He said, I'm not wasting, waiting. You wasted enough of my time. And so he was getting the money, and he said, never mind. I don't want your stinking money, and walked out. And I'm sitting there thinking, what in the world is wrong with this person? Okay, and, and he was just angry. And so I ate my meal, and I'd slowed down, and I really thought about it because I'm telling you what I wanted to do. I wanted to walk out to that guy's pickup truck and ask him what his problem was. That's what I wanted to do, but the Lord said, sit down and shut up. And it just floored me that somebody would act that way. So when I got ready to leave, I went up to the counter, and I said, could I talk to your manager? And, and she goes, I mean, her eyes just popped open. And I said to the manager, I want you to know my hamburger was great. Your service was wonderful. Everything is good, okay? Don't let one person ruin your day. And I'm telling you, everybody, all the... You know, everybody just stopped to see all the workers. Okay, and I'm not bragging on me. I, my whole point is how, what, I have no idea what set him off, but the anger was just ridiculous. You look on TV, watch TV, watch the news. People are angry all the time. And folks, we have to understand that anger is never good. Now, there is righteous anger. The Bible speaks of righteous anger, but not, you know, chewing people out, not having an attitude, not being mean. And, and people that get angry are usually mean. And here's what he says, but he was angry, and his father would not let him go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. Folks, the Bible says in Ephesians 4.26, be angry and do not sin. We can have righteous anger. We can be upset over sin, but we are not to take that out on the sinner. We are all sinners. We are all saved by grace. God has forgiven us. So we, we, we need to understand the damage anger can do. And this elder brother had an attitude of anger. Proverbs 22. Go there with me. Proverbs 22, verse 24. 25. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man do not go, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. Here's what will happen, folks. You hang around angry people, and eventually that anger is going to spew on you. They're going to get on you sometime. And folks, uh, the Bible is, is just full. Proverbs has several scriptures that says we do not need to be angry. We do not need to lose our temper. We do not need to get mad. So we see 
this elder brother, the first issue he had was an attitude of anger. The second uh, issue he had was an attitude of self-righteousness. Look at verse 29. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never uh, transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I may make merry with my friend. Well, when I read this, the first thing I noticed in this text, so he answered and said to his father, I, three times, he said, I, I, and I. What does the Bible say about I? Folks, there are a lot of people that have eye trouble, and I'm not talking about your eyes, okay? And the Bible clearly says, folks, it truly is not about me. It's not about us, okay? There will be times when things are inconvenient. There will be situations that you don't understand. But it's not about us. He made everything about him. And the other thing I, I know, uh, when you read this second line in here, you're thinking, you you got to be kidding me. Because what he's literally saying to me is, I've never sinned. I've never sinned against my father, okay? So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you, which I'm sure is true. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. Is there such thing as a perfect child? I mean, there is no such thing, folks. When they were young, they, the Bible tells us we are born into sin. And so the second attitude he had was this attitude of self-righteousness that he had never done anything wrong, that he deserved, uh, you know, this. He deserved, uh, you know, the fatted calf because he did. He, you know, he, he never sinned. He never hurt his father. He never said anything cross to his father. And folks, I truly, really, I don't believe that. And he said, yet you never gave me a goat that I may marry with my uh, friend. And Again, you see here not only self-righteousness, but another word that to me slipped in here is the sin of pride. The sin of pride, okay? And pride is just, it's one of those things that we, you know, don't, don't like to own up to. But when you see I, 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 and I, it's, that's really the, the root of the problem in this uh, elder brother's life was the sin of pride. And you know the other thing that's hard in, in people, this is true all the time, folks. Someone who is self-righteous, someone who is ate up with pride, can't see it, okay? Because, why? Because they're always right, okay? Think of the scribes and the Pharisees. You know, they, on the outside, looked like they did everything right. Matter of fact, Jesus, in more than one text, spoke of the self-righteous scribes and Pharisees. And this was really what Jesus was pointing out in this story. You guys look like everything is up and up. And you put your robes on, you pray on the corners, uh, you do the law, you probably memorize some of the law, you even give, okay? But folks, it's a difference in doing the right thing on the outside compared to doing the right thing on the inside. Folks, the whole thing in our lives is we can appear to be flawless, but folks, we are all sinners saved by grace. And uh, Jesus used this, this example about self-righteousness. Look, uh, just turn a page and look at uh, Luke 18. Look at eight, Luke 18, verse 9. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Now think about that. What, is, what does it mean to pray by yourself or with yourself? Okay? What it tells me is, you know, uh, you know, you want to be seen. You want to, you know, be pointed out. 
okay? You want to be acknowledged on what you do. And then another thing, and even spiritual-wise, you can pray by yourself, and the Holy Spirit may not be anywhere near that place, okay? Folks, we need God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in our prayers. But he stood by himself and said this, and, and again, you know, Jesus told him, you know, don't, you know, go, go in secret, okay? Don't pray to where you sit. Don't, you don't try to flower people with words. Don't try to be more spiritual than you are. And the Pharisee stood and prayed with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Notice what snuck in here? That word I again. That word I. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I mean, how bold are you to pray a prayer like that out loud? Okay? It reminds me also of where Jesus was making a point when this woman was caught in adultery. And he said, you who are without sin, you cast the first stone. And folks, I'm telling you, from the oldest to the youngest, they walked away because of the conviction that, that the Holy Spirit put on these folks. And you look at the list of things. These are the biggies, okay? And then he gives his spiritual resume there. Look at verse 12. I fast twice a week. Well, there goes your blessing because you're telling everybody. I give tithes of all that I possess. Really? Is it true or is it not true? The tax collector standing afar off would not so much raise his eyes to heaven, but be his breath. What was that? Folks, it was a sign of mourning. It was, it was a sign of pain. It was a sign of aching. A sign of seeing his sins for what they are. Okay, and if you were observing this scene, you know, there would be people that just would look and just say, man, look at the spirituality of that guy. And Look at that tax collector. What's he doing? Why is he, why is he so upset? Why is he beating his chest? He's in church. He's in the temple. You're not supposed to do that. Oh, folks, I'm just telling you, when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of us, we need to repent, folks. We need to repent. And it says, but he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He, he didn't give any spiritual resume. He didn't give his date that he got saved or baptized or anything else. He said, God, please be merciful to me. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees of four, you know, when do you want your reward? You want your reward right now? You want men to praise you? Okay? Or do you want reward from your Father who is in heaven and, and humbled? Uh, you know, God, God has a way of doing that, folks, to people that are proud and the two people that, uh, you know, just, you know, uh, have a self-righteous attitude. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. I think Jesus there. And here's, here's the, the deal with this. The elder son done the right thing. He stayed. He worked. He, you know, did what he was supposed to do, but he did it with the wrong attitude. And folks, attitude is everything. And it's just like in life, okay? Even in our Christian life. I want to be around people that will look at a roadblock and say, hey, you know what? There's a way out here. I want to be around positive people say, that will say, hey, if we all get together, we can do this. I want to be around people who will say, with God, all things are possible. And that's what this, this uh, uh, you know, that, that's the opposite of what this elder brother did. And he did the right thing, but with the wrong attitude. And Jesus here was pointing that out, not only to the elder son, uh, but to the scribes and the Pharisees. So we see an attitude of anger, we see an attitude of self-righteousness, and we see an attitude of, of self-centeredness. 
So look back in our text, verse 30. And he said unto him, uh, uh, wait, let me finish that. He, you, verse, verse 30, excuse me. But as soon as his son of yours came, no, notice what he said, son of yours. He's not my brother, okay? He's your son. So you can see an attitude there. He came, who has devoured your livelihood. What is he doing? He's protesting here. My why question is, whose livelihood was it? Well, it was the father's. And the father can do what he wants to with it, okay? He can do what he wants to with it. Who has devoured your livelihood with harlots. What is he doing? Pointing out someone else's sin. And I'm telling you, the scribes and Pharisees love, a scribe and a Pharisee loves to point out other people's sin. But, but even, you know, Granny had a lot of good sayings. You know, when you point the finger at someone else, three are pointing right back at you. You say, who are those three? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Folks, we should judge nobody. That's God's job, not ours. Harlots. He embarrassed our family. You killed the fatted calf for them. What did he have in his heart? Folks, he had resentment. The other word that he had, he had entitlement. And man, I am telling you, this is America. Entitlement. So many people think God owes them something or that other people owe them something. Let me tell you an honest assessment of what I believe with all my heart. God owes us nothing. He owes us nothing. And he chose you. He saved you. He's preserved you. He's given you life. He gives you blessings and joy in your life. And not only that, he's going to let you spend an eternity with him. So we should not, as Christians, have this ideal of entitlement or resentment. Verse 31 says, And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have, is yours. What was the father trying to do? Not just smooth things over. Get this elder son to see the way things really are. He, he did. He put a roof over his el- old, oldest son's head. He allowed him to work there, and, and I'm sure he paid him well. And if you start to look at all the blessings that he had, but he wasn't looking at the other son had this attitude of self-centeredness. It's about me. Why didn't you think about me? And, and all that the, the, that the dad could think about, this father could think about, was that son that was lost. And he said, verse 32, it was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead. Okay, and, and again, I've heard it preached both ways. The prodigal son was lost and he got saved. I've heard that he was saved and he just came home. Okay, and I'm, I'm not going to argue either of those points. But, you know, when something is dead and you read the book of Romans, that means it has no spiritual life in it. Okay, why would somebody be upset that another person got saved? And why would this brother, in my opinion, I just want to clarify that, in my opinion, dead is without life. And why would he be upset because, his father, because the brother uh, had a, a, a life-changing experience? He was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. Folks, uh, Ephesians speaks to us. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. I quoted... Verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. But look down in verse 29. Verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. What was the elder brother doing? He was chastising his younger brother. Is that his place to do that? No, folks. If the father wants to do that, that's his place. If God the Father wants to do that, That's his place. But sometimes we say such hurtful things to others. You know, we 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 pop off and we say things. 
and we don't have the right attitude about certain situations. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for the necessary edification that it may impart grace to the heal- to the hearers. What did his dad do for the elder son? He, had, he, he imparted grace to his elder son. What did he do to his younger son? He did the very same thing. He imparted grace to him. Verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed from the day of redemption. And folks, I believe with all my heart, uh, a bad attitude grieves the Holy Spirit. I believe it grieves the Holy Spirit. And, and again, you know, when we think about uh, resentment and, you know, self-centeredness and self-righteousness, I believe all that grieves the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, there's that word, clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. Of course, we know malice is, you know, uh, wanting to get even. Malice is wanting to do harm, wanting to hurt. And it's not always physical hurt that hurts. Folks, words hurt. Because when you say words, you can't take them back. Okay, you can say I'm not kidding. You can say I was just joking. But I think people know whether that is true or not. And here's the verse, and I want to end on a positive note. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted. Who was the tenderhearted one in this? It was the Father. It was our Heavenly Father. Folks, even when we have been wrong, we need to be tenderhearted, forgiving one another. This older brother should have forgiven his brother. He should have welcomed his brother home. He should have been glad to see him again, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. And again, what has God given us? Think about it, folks. Everything. He has given us everything. And and truly, Everything we have is a gift from God. So don't look at what you don't have. Don't look at situations that really don't affect you. That that whole situation was between that father and that younger brother. And while he should have went and went to this dinner and went and hugged his brother and did that, he would not do it because he had a wrong attitude. I pray. I pray that as we go out in this world, first and foremost, that people know that we are Christians. And not only that they know we are Christians, but they can sense the Holy Spirit and forgiveness and love and tenderheartedness in our lives. Father, thank you for this uh, text. God, I know the prodigal son is known. I mean, we, we've been hearing it since we were five years old. But God, sometimes there needs to be a different slant, a different emphasis. And God, I just pray that we would not be like the elder brother. God, I pray we would just get control of our anger. If we have anger issues, we really need help with that. And God, I pray we wouldn't be self-righteous or self-centered. God, I pray that we would just, uh, uh, and, and really what I think real bothers me the most about the elder guys uh, he had everything, but there was no joy in his life. He did not have joy. He was just existing. And God, I pray that the joy of the Lord would be our strength. God, I just pray, Lord, uh, that we would be positive, that we would encourage people, that we would welcome people home. We would welcome people back to church, and we would welcome people back into our lives. So God, just thank you. Thank you for always being there. Thank you for giving us so, so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rahill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.